Well, greetings, you loyal legion of accursed. David Hurley here with my podmates, three beautiful political minds who clean up pretty fucking well for a wedding party, I would say, whether they're wearing a James Bond dinner jacket like Corey or a drop-dead gorgeous sequined gown. Scott, you looked amazing in that. Actually, it was Jordan. <laughs> and Jordan, yes, you were stunning on Saturday. What a wedding. Corey, thanks for having me there. That was a great time. Congratulations. Well, thank you very much. I uh, had, a, had a really good time myself. Uh, not surprisingly, it was, it was great, to, <laughs> great to see lots of family and, uh, and friends that uh, sort of uh, cross the political spectrum and uh, the different kind of jobs I've had in the past. So it was, uh, almost felt like a little reunion for, for folks as well. So it was good. You have friends who aren't friends. Yeah, well, <clears throat> but that's kind of easy. Like, you know, well, <laughs> uh, when, <laughs> when you, they, they tend to not be in, uh, in the conservative party, they tend to be in the liberal party because, you know, you're, you're the victim of tribalism in your own party, uh, right. but you can right. uh, kind of bypass it all if you're, if you're dealing with folks in, uh, in another party. I think my my favorite part was meeting Corey's parents in which it became immediately obvious why Corey is like a nice human. First, (laughs) your parents were so lovely. And second, you were raised surrounded by CCFers in Saskatchewan. So it all, it Mm. all makes total sense. There's hope for you yet, you know? (laughs) Yeah. I met your sister. I kind of wish she'd got involved in politics. Yeah. She's uh, been a social worker for 30 years in uh, in Saskatchewan and, (laughs) Uh, and uh, I don't know of uh, jobs out there that uh, I know I could never do, but I'm sure glad there are people doing them. It's uh, people, people in social work are are, uh, are heroes. All right. All right. Well, I, well I'm sorry, yeah. Corey, that I missed it. Uh, but I just want to ask you a question, and I and I wish you, <laughs> your lovely bride, nothing but the best. But deep down, don't you think that marriage as an institution is essentially a plot? to have us <laughs> sand off all of our hunter-gatherer impulses and lead us into sort of agrarian mediocrity. <laughs> like, don't you think? Yeah, I, I don't know. I guess it you're depends doing who it you're... Twice. This is returning to the scene of crime. What the fuck is wrong? <laughs> well, you know, starter marriages don't always go well. You know, some, some people think they need to take a, a second crack, but... Uh, uh, yeah, I don't think you have to worry about any of those things uh, with Nicole. She's uh, uh, she's pretty hardcore in every way I can I could ever appreciate. Awesome. Uh, so former former spy and grew up all over the world, but most importantly was born in in Moose Jaw, Saskatchewan. So that's uh, that's that's the key. Um, all right, let's get started. Uh, we're doing this just uh, before the polls close in. Uh, in uh, polls open for the last day of voting in Toronto for the mayoralty. We're not going to talk about that because the results aren't in. Maybe talk about it next week if it merits it. Anyway, if you're in Toronto, go out and vote. Uh, but th- we do have some by-elections to break down. There were uh, four federal ridings and then those BC results in provincial by-elections this week that caught my eye. We'll do an end-of-session SWOT assessment of Parliament. Where are each of the parties at and what do they need to think about going forward? Our cursed clipping. Is Sean Tele Bear's piece in the star on Pierre Polyev nine months into his tenure as conservative leader? Finally, I'll summon the magnificent Mr. Pinson to herald out our hey use. Scott, Corey, Jordan. Um, so we didn't talk about the by-elections last week. They happened a week ago. Lots of ink spilled on them since then. All was dangerous to overanalyze by-elections. No seats changed hands anyway. Uh, in the result, but there's still some things worth watching there. I think the CPC got a big margin over Bernier and kept him below 20% of the vote, which was important for them. But the messaging from that by-election might have spilled over into Winnipeg and resulted in a very large win for Ben Carr and the Liberals in the Winnipeg by-election. In Oxford, in Ontario, the CPC held on in a somewhat tight race, uh, but likely in large part due to the Closeness was likely due to local divisions in the CPC. NDP had a terrible night, losing vote share everywhere. Scott, what did you see in all that? Anything um, that matters? Uh, probably not. I mean, I know we, we, we strive to find meaning, but I think probably not. I think um, a couple of things, uh, if Forrest jump out at me, that caused me to be curious. Uh, one thing is good for the Liberals, one thing is good for the CPC. I will just say, apart from that, uh, liberals, 
I don't know the uh, the PC. I don't know the CPC winning candidates as well. But um, uh, for the Liberals, they also get two good MPs. Like this Ben Carr guy seems like he's a uh, um, uh, a real gem. And yeah. I've known Andy Ganey since university. She's a tremendous person, and you know that's uh, that's a good thing. Yeah. So um, uh, you know it's uh, easy to overlook. Uh, the actual people, you know, you think about what's the vote result for all the parties. It's like occasionally one of the people that actually gets elected turns out to matter also, right? So <laughs> keep your eye on uh, folks for futures. Uh, the good thing with the Liberals, I thought, was um, was what you already hinted at, David. I think the fact that the Liberals can take the C- CNS agreement and run it right up the polls in terms of deflating uh, NDP vote. You know, I... I really wonder, I'll be curious to hear what Jordan has to say. I listened to the pod last week when you had the Chiefs on, and I heard Brian Topp saying, well, you know, look, the challenge is that, you know, the NDP have to find a way to translate this agreement into votes not for the Liberal Party, but votes for themselves. I didn't hear him then finish that sentence and say, here's how. I don't know how. And I don't know that the NDP know how, and I don't know that they're going to figure out how. But right now, I think the most obvious effect of the CNS agreement, other than extending the life of the government, is that it uh, makes uh, Justin Trudeau very palatable to NDP voters. And we know that in terms of voter preference. Um, so I think that's very good news for the Liberals that they can maintain that. Uh, combined with, you know, Pierre Polyev and his positioning, which we'll talk about later in the context of Chantel's column, I think that all augurs... Uh, as well as you could possibly hope for the, for the Liberals. So I think that's the positive thing for them. The positive thing for the CPC, and again, I'll be curious to hear what Corey thinks, I think I'm a contrarian to what most of the conventional wisdom is. I look at the um, I, I look at these results, and I think this is a big win for Team Polyev. I mean, I know that there's a bunch of lingering questions. There's an ugly goddamn messaging coming out of uh, at least one of those writings um, that has the potential to stick to Polyev, and you have to presume that at least his his team at least tolerated, if not, and did not endorse it. Um, but I look at it, this was billed, you know, there's going to be a big showdown. They parachuted a candidate into Oxford, supposed to cause all kinds of problems. Looks to me like Team Polyev muscled that thing through and they win their way. And now it's kind of like, hey, guys, we won. So shut the fuck up. Okay, it's our show. We're running it for better or for worse. So it looks to me like they have clear command and authority. Um, I don't see any evidence that there's, a backlash. If this vote had been really tight or they'd lost, then maybe, but I don't see that happening. So I think that puts them firmly in control. And I think that result with Bernie is about as good as they could hope. Now he'll never go away and he could steal 4%, 5% from you in the next election. That's an ongoing challenge. And it's something they have to really think about in the context, again, of the Chantel column and where they're positioned. But um, overall, I think, you know, if it leaves Paul Ev and his team in firm command and control. And I just, you know, that that may mean that they're free to run the w- car straight into a brick wall. But, uh, you know, all this talk of, oh, well, you know, it shows you how divided they are. It shows you that they're in a weakened position. I, like, I don't know, man. They won two fucking ridings and they had two challenging dynamics and they dunked. So uh, that's where I'm at. Jordan. Yeah, I mean, I don't disagree with a lot of Scott's <laughs> points. Uh, I disagree with some of them, which I'll get to. But yeah, I think I think as it goes to the CPC vote in the by elections, yeah, I mean, there's certainly an argument to be made. Like close only counts on horseshoes and hand grenades, right? They got the thing done, and it's uh, at the end of the day that's what's going to matter. I do though think that the the by election and obviously particularly Portage Lisger has revealed some costs to the Polyev strategy. And I think we'll be able to talk more about that when we talk about uh, Hebert's clipping. But it really did seem to me that we ended up with a situation where the by-elections weren't so much a referendum on Trudeau and the Liberals, but they were actually much more a referendum on Polyev, certainly uh, certainly in, in Oxford and, and Portage Lisgar. And I think that that's a really interesting dynamic. And it, it speaks to the just the way that his strategy hasn't been able to achieve a clean liftoff. And as for the NDP results, I mean, these are not favorable ridings for the NDP generally at the best of times and low turnout uh, is just so tough for the NDP. So that I'm not all that surprised. And I don't, I also don't think the party put an enormous amount of resources into any of these by-elections knowing that the results were pretty much preordained and it wasn't going to be them. 
Um, I do think that the bleed to the liberals is always something to be worried about, but that's like a known dynamic, right? With, with the, what if you're bleeding both ways? What if you're yeah. bleeding both ways? What if you mm-hmm. are bleeding because of the CNS on the center side to the liberals? And what if Polyev is coming after the NDP working class vote and getting it? I think that wouldn't necessarily happen in the same regions. So I could certainly see Polyev coming, you know, we know he's coming for Northern Ontario, for example, coming after working class voters there and looking to have New Democrats make the jump. I, I think that, though, that the, the phenomenon of, of bleeding to the Liberals, obviously, that's not unique to the CNS. That is present in every campaign, and it's particularly present in campaigns where the Conservatives are viewed as a scarier alternative. So that's yeah. a familiar dynamic for the party. Uh, as you hinted at, though, there's also not one magical solution to that to hold that vote. So that's going to be, you know, and we'll get to kind of our end of session assessments. But this is really the challenge that's ahead of Singh and the New Democrats as they look past the summer is how do you stick by the agreement in terms of the positives that it's giving you and still leverage that uh, for that for those soft voters that might be tempted to go the other way if they don't like how Pierre's looking. All right. All right, Corey. You, uh, you, you know, you have fresh eyes on this. You took last week off. Uh, you're coming back. Uh, you've had time to reflect on these by-elections. Let's not spend too much time on them, but what do you think? Yeah, I, I'm, I'm largely where Scott is. Um, uh, I think that, uh, you know, it was in terms of, you know, the parties that were expected to win, won. Um, I think that the 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 uh, Portage Lisker one is is interesting to me uh, because you know you had a not well known candidate running against the leader of uh, the People's Party and they still dropped in vote, uh, and I, I think the motivation level of of uh, uh, People's Party voters is probably higher. So you know in a smaller voter pool like that the fact that they went down is uh, I think you know in a general election they're going to be maybe half that number. So I think I think there's encouraging news there. I'm not surprised by that. Like if we looked at what happened in the last Ontario provincial election, for instance, you know, Ford was the guy who brought in a whole bunch of the pandemic measures that those guys hate, and the and the PPC type parties uh, basically collapsed and folded in behind him anyway. So like I just don't see see that as a big worry. Uh, you know, Oxford was uh, you know was uh, a less pleasant result for them, but it's still enough to win. And uh, you know, that's something that you know we've seen in many other ridings where there's a a big nomination fight, and uh, you see the former MP endorse the Liberals, and you know, so you're gonna that's gonna move some. I mean, this was a little direction. next but, level, in complete fairness. <laughs> yeah, but like you know, we had that happen in one riding in the last provincial election too. Like it, it happens. I think what will be interesting around the nominations is that the the convoy crowd are you know very motivated and they can exercise a lot of power at a nomination level fight because uh, they're small in numbers but they're they're big in motivation. I think it's going to be a challenge uh, for the CPC to uh, uh, not elect a bunch of wing nut candidates uh, through their nomination process who end up using messaging that that bleeds into the main campaign and disrupts the main campaign and. You know, I think there's some people who've been nominated that fit that category, and I'd say that because we threw them the fuck out of our party provincially because they were uh, off message and leaking to the media and and engaging in, you know, sorts of behaviors that are not conducive to uh, to su- having a successful main campaign. So, um, you know, it's it's no no big surprise who those folks were, but uh, you know, I think that will be a challenge that they'll have going forward. But like, hey, can I you ask know, you this? I, if, yeah, yeah. So in a normal circumstance, no, normal circumstance is the wrong way to use it. Say, say a historic PC campaign, a Mulroney campaign, let's use archetypal, might have seen the CP, might have seen the PPC as a useful extreme force against which to triangulate mm-hmm. your party and use it to make you look reasonable because there are extremists out there and they're those people and you don't deal with them, you're different. So actually, normally you might not want them to disappear, but you might want them around as a nominal outlet and place to triangulate against, as I said. But that doesn't seem to be what Polyev wants to do. Polyev wants to get them out of the way entirely. Can you talk to me a little bit about that? (laughs) 
Well, I think he's trying to outbid them in some areas, or or at least come parallel, close enough to parallel to them on some of these issues as to uh, you know uh, take away take the wind out of their sails. I just don't think you have to do that. To to be honest, I think uh, there's always going to be a marginal vote, and whether it's going to the Libertarian Party or whether it's going to you know the Christian Heritage Party, whatever they, they, those things have always existed, but they you know exist in in low single digit numbers. So you know I. Yeah, I think there's a there's a thing there, but you know, we I think we only had two open nominations in the last provincial election here uh, for the Conservatives, uh, and we basically you know appointed people or had people uh, run and discouraged others from from running against them uh, for all the rest of the ridings uh, because we knew uh, coming out of the pandemic if we didn't we would have every second one of those people maybe every one of those people be uh, selected by the convoy crowd and we would uh, we would have torn the campaign and the government in two and so like i think uh, you need to have a unity of message and uh, you know i always come back to this the saying that politics is a team sport it absolutely is and you need to have everybody on your team uh, agreeing to a campaign on a, a on a singular set of issues you can't have people out there freelancing on you know uh, uh, contrails from jets causing climate change or Wi-Fi giving you cancer or whatever other conspiracy people uh, uh, have researched on uh, on their own on the internet. Pollination. This is a kind of an odd way to start a message about investing, eh? But stay with me, Hurley Burleyites. If you're of my vintage, you'll recall tracing those detailed illustrations of flowers, labeling the stamen, stigma, and pistol, maybe snickering a little bit as you learned about fertilization and how the natural world flourishes. In 2020, when it was time to name their new $100 million social impact fund, our presenting sponsor, TELUS, couldn't have made a better choice in my humble opinion. The TELUS Pollinator Fund for Good invests in early stage for-profit companies where making the world a better place is baked into their business model across four key pillars supporting responsible agriculture, caring for our planet, transforming healthcare, and enabling inclusive communities. Tell us his role in all this. Well, there's the seed money they put into these innovative companies, but tell us also recognizes these mission-driven diverse company founders can use help in other important ways. So they leverage their own broad network and make key introductions that open a bunch of business doors as well as provide world-leading technology, all to help guide these startups to maximum growth and impact. So far, it's working. Just a couple of weeks ago, the fund released its second annual impact report. It's an immensely detailed piece, detailing the nearly $40 million invested so far. Here are the broad strokes. The portfolio has now doubled to 26 companies. There's been a 155% revenue increase across all investments. 54% of portfolio companies are led by Indigenous and racialized founders, 42% are led by women, and 1.1 million lives have been impacted through improved services, products, or income. That's a hell of a lot of pollinating for good. And like a bee transferring pollen grains from one flower to another, I'll bring you a couple of interesting investment stories from the fund next time. So the impact continues to grow. To learn more, go to telus.com slash pollinator. So swinging wildly out to the West Coast, there were two by-elections in BC, and normally I wouldn't pay that much attention to two provincial by-elections, but it it almost felt to me like it could be important, almost felt to me like there could be some shift in the partisan alignment going on out there that was important. Because it's not that the NDP held on to their two relatively safe seats. One of them had been held by Horgan, one of them had been held by a minister, so they were good seats. But they crushed in them. They absolutely crushed in them. And BC United, the newly renamed Liberal Party, died a horrible death in both those elections. Who, boy, the numbers were bad. In one, they were at 14%. And in the other, they fell all the way to fourth place. And the Conservatives finished second with 20% of the vote. And the BC United well behind there, despite their obvious branding attempt to capture those voters. So, Corey, 
can I stay with you and ask you, is this a brand? Is this a rebranding exercise gone very, very wrong? What the fuck is happening? Yeah, yeah I would say there's an indication of that. Uh, like, look, the, the, the Langford uh, one, um, you know, is, is, is interesting. I think that uh, my parents actually live in that riding uh, now on the, on the coast. Um, uh, the NDP number went down from, from what it was in the last election. Uh, but uh, that's maybe not entirely surprising, given that the premier was running in the last general election in that riding. But uh, but the the uh, the conservatives, uh, I don't think that's an area where they've traditionally been very strong. So uh, yeah, it's it's interesting. Like you know, it's, it would look like there's a bit of a battle as to who the opposition, the main opposition party is. Um, my my from away perspective of uh, of uh, BC United is that they are. Um, uh, and at a leadership level, not very clear what their purpose is, what they're there to do. You know, what is what is it that you're about? It's a little bit amorphous. And if it's just we're the opposition to the NDP, I don't think that's enough. I think they've got to really spend some time um, thinking about and figuring out how to communicate what their 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 basic value proposition is uh, to voters in BC. Um, yeah, you know, I think the NDP government is, uh, you know, under Horgan, pro uh, you know, probably uh, one of the best NDP administrations that we've seen in a long, long time in terms of uh, its uh, ability to sustain its own popularity and its ability to attract sort of centrist voters. Like Horgan, uh, I would say, is closer to Doug Ford on the political continuum than uh, uh, than he is to, uh, uh, say, uh, Kathleen Wynne. All right. Right, Jordan. What's your take on what's happening out in BC? Did you? Uh, yeah, I mean, I mean, I think a couple of things. So you know, well, it, it's not maybe surprising that the NDP held these ridings. It still was a first test for EB, right? And I and I think that that's the the results are pretty resounding on that count. So that's got to be pretty reassuring for folks in Victoria there. But my main takeaway is that this was just this was a horrible night for Falcon for his leadership. So he won the leadership of BC United, promising to bring the party back to in the cities and the suburbs. And like this is, and he's demonstrating that they really made no progress on that. It's just brutal. Like in Langford, you know, as you were saying, but like the Conservatives got twice, BC Conservatives got twice the vote that BC United did. It's it's uh it's just a shellacking. So I think this is very encouraging for the government there, and it it speaks to. Um, the way I think that some of the goodwill has transitioned between premiers, and so that's going to be reassuring for, for folks there that their strategy is sound to continue with that, uh, notwithstanding various policy bumps on the road. Um, but for BC United, this has got to be a big wake-up call. The rebrand is not doing what they thought it would do. It would almost um, have sun, done, certainly done better under the yes, Liberal banner, wouldn't you think? That's it, yeah. And right. I think that that's what's a really fascinating takeaway from this, is if you just change the name and the rebrand is sort of devoid of a value proposition that makes any sense to voters, uh, then, you know, there you are, you're just sitting there with your ass in your hand, right? And and that's exactly what happened to Falcon. Right. Well, I'll just add a quick three quick takeaways. One, Horgan um, established the NDP as a central party, and Evie's been able um, to not undermine that. I mean, that was the question about Evie was whether he would take the party to the left, <laughs> you know. And and so so far, he's not fucked that up. And the uh, as as Jordan says, the by elections are a validation that he hasn't he hasn't done anything to screw up that. Uh, very nicely balanced recipe that Horgan uh, established. Uh, so that's strike number one against, you know, BC United, right? They, they, they've got an opponent um, who managed to move into the middle. And the middle is where you always want to be because that's where the most votes are, the greatest and most well-established cliche in Canadian politics. Second, um, you know, they dropped the word liberal. And, you know, because they thought it was such a goddamn anchor. Well, it turns out that actually that was just another indication to centrist voters, at least some centrist voters, that they were no longer centrist or something else. Don't know what they are. BC United, don't know if you're left, right, up, down, north, south, but like whatever, you're not. So I'm sure that they must have lost some uh, votes from that brand. And third and uh, other important thing I think we have to acknowledge, because it's just a fundamental fact of 
campaigning in 2023, Kevin Falcon doesn't seem to be very good and uh, certainly hasn't captivated people. He's been hanging around BC politics for a long, long time. He's always wanted his shot. He's never uh, seemed to have uh, stormed uh, people uh, all that effectively. So, you know, the party's going through this restructuring, rebrand, trying to reposition itself. And it seems to me like it's become actually a bit of a perfect storm, right? And the impression that's left, it is no longer a centrist party, don't know what it is. Um, and, you know, in a post-convoy, post-pandemic world, you're going to have a lot of small C conservative voices that are more than happy to just say, like, we'll, we'll ride whatever bandwagon seems to be the most uh, hard ass. And I think it just left them nowhere. So I, I think, you know, this was a rebrand that was supposed to, you know, give them a brand new Fight off the power. conservative, Scott. It was supposed to fight off the conservative vote, which soared. Yeah. It's going great. So, I mean, it just looks to me like a complete failure. And if I were there, I'd be saying to myself, we have to go right straight back to code. We can't change this fucking weird name we have. But, like, you know, we have to think about, do we get rid of our leader? What do we need to do to position? Um, what do we do about our right flank? How do we do that at the same time that we don't abandon the center once and for all and put ourselves in the can for a generation? Um, it's I think it's a full fledged. Full oh, no, it's a five alarm fire. fire. It's a five alarm fire for that party. They yeah. got to. Uh, it's time for one of those all the king's horses and all the king's <laughs> men sessions. Well, uh, we saw something similar, though, in with the establishment of a new party with the Saskatchewan party. Like it took a while to establish a narrative and a brand around that uh, that was sustainable. And, uh, you know, it was supposed to be a merger of, of the conservative PCs and, and the Liberal Party, but then the Liberal Party ended up running candidates anyway and having the balance of power in the legislature. So, like, I, I think, you know, uh, some sort of union with uh, the BC Conservatives uh, is something I think is a, a necessary precondition to having BC United be successful. And uh, and that might take some time. And that and that the consequence of that may be that they are out of the play for an election cycle or two, right? If yeah. that's the first most necessary condition to survival, right? Then that means they have to lurch to the right. Means they make themselves unelectable in a whole variety of places with a whole variety of voters. But then they hope that they consolidate their position enough to survive. And then over time, they can migrate, get a new leader, and and inch back toward the center without blowing up the coalition. It is a. It's at least a two term, maybe a three. term I like both strategy. scenarios it's for Eb. <laughs> <laughs> no, well, no, no kidding. As long as the NDP continues to pursue a sort of a more centrist government in BC, and and they're more, and they're focused on that sort of Horgan narrative, it's hard to see them being disrupt, disrupted easily by uh, in this election. But we'll see. So last week, Transport Minister Omar El Gabra, a recent guest on this pod, was at a G seven meeting in Japan talking about, yes, supply chains. If it sounds like everybody is focused on supply chains nowadays, that's because they are. Supply chains keep us supplied. And in the past few years, they've developed sclerosis. Stuff is less available. Climate change, the pandemic, and Russia's attack on Ukraine are most to blame, but not solely. Anyway, the G7 ministers were seized with the topic, as summit organizers like to say, Canada advanced two ideas for rebuilding supply chains better. Increased coordination by players and the establishment of so-called green corridors between Canada, Japan, and Britain. Our sponsor, CN, would like to offer applause. CN has long argued that the sort of coordination and collaboration Minister Al Gabra was promoting is the only way to make our supply chains more fluid and to brace them against major disruptions like wars and disease. The key is data. I've said this before. Every player in the chain must contribute. CN already makes a massive volume of its data available. If shippers, truckers, producers, maritime companies, and governments were all as transparent, we would be much closer to clear, smooth supply chains. Any policy not anchored in data is just aspirational, or a guess. Data allows for fact-based decision-making and elimination of inefficiencies. The other important piece is sensible, stable regulation. Governments should help supply chain players cooperate, not tell them how to perform. They already know how to do their jobs. As for green corridors, well, hurrah. Rail use is far less energy to move cargo than trucks or airplanes, and CN has relentlessly lowered its emissions in recent years. It was nice to hear the G7 leaders unanimously recognize that in their official declaration. It was couched in the usual obscure diplomatese, 
But basically, they declared that railways are environmentally friendly, efficient, and really, the future of transportation. Hear, hear, honorable members. All right, Corey, you, you didn't respond because you were hungover from your wedding, but Scott <laughs> and Jordan were pretty excited about this clipping by Chantelle Bear, so we're going <laughs> to... <laughs> Fair enough. In, in, the, in, this, in this Toronto Star, Chantelle Bear writes in an early verdict on Pierre Polyev, nine months into his tenure, there is no denying that the latest CPC leader is having a measurable impact on Canada's federal dynamics. But is it the kind of impact the Conservatives need to return to the government benches? The early evidence suggests otherwise. Despite a first ballot leadership victory, Polyev is struggling to unite the Conservative movement behind him. If anything, fractures within the party have become deeper over the first months of his tenure. Such divisions were on exhibit over the campaigns that led to Monday's federal by-elections. Manitoba riding of Portage Lisker was the scene of an ugly fratricidal war between Maxime Bernier and the Polyev forces. Meanwhile, in the Oxford writing, uh, part of the local CPC establishment campaigned for the Liberals. Increasingly these days, Conservative insiders tend to be more critical of Polyev's approach than his Liberal, NDP and Bloc rivals. Those critics include prospective star candidates who, only six months ago, were seriously considering of running under the CPC banner. Former Prime Minister Brian Mulroney spoke for many of them when he dismissed tactics to undermine the Liberal government and praised Trudeau's leadership. In the same vein, it's impossible not to note the distance Ontario's Premier Doug Ford has been keeping from his federal Conservative counterpart. The signal coming from Queen's Park is that when it comes to beating Trudeau, Polyev is essentially on his own. Okay. Uh, Jordan, start. What do you like about it? What do you think about it? Do you think it's right? You liked it so much, you made it your computer wallpaper. You were saying it. <laughs> No, listen, I liked it. I liked it. I think it's maybe a little optimistic, but I, I liked elements of it. I think that there's a lot of truth to some pieces. And it's, as we've talked a little bit about so far, so Portage Lisgar, like, yes, was a win for sure. But it came at a cost. And I think that the what struck me was how worried with the tacit approval of what I can only assume is central, that local campaign was about Bernier and that, that the strategy there was to outbid him on the craziness in order to make a point and secure that win. And so I know, you know, others have written about this, but I think it's worth discussing the examples. So pulling up photos of Bernier at Pride, um, Talking Davos, World Economic Forum, like this is just like the kooky shit, right? So pulling all of these things out and using those to me says like two things. It says that there's a willingness to put that stuff out there in the public realm where it can cycle freely into other ridings as it might have into Winnipeg. Uh, and that that's a cost that folks in the party are willing to bear at the moment. And secondly, that they are really going for, as Corey has mentioned, like an absolute annihilation strategy with the PPC. And I am just not sure that that is possible. And so they are going to continue, if they continue down this path, what you're going to have happening is the sharp edges that, that are hampering Polyev's uh, likability with women, with other key demographics that he's going to need to appeal to if he wants to pass his ceiling, uh, are only getting deeper, that it's it's not helping. And I think when I look back over the last, well, the spring really, since December, um, it actually seems like his team is deepening those tendencies rather than seeking ways to move away from it and tack towards the center. You're actually seeing a doubling down on trying to outbid the PPC for these very hard rate right voters. And so now this stuff is out there and he's driving up his own unfavorables. So I do think that, I think Heber has a really good point on some of these in terms of how he's underperforming, because when you flip the coin around on the other side, his messaging on the economy remains the most compelling out of any of the federal parties. It is extremely strong. And I think it's dangerous to underestimate him because when he's speaking about things like housing, and like cost of living, he is really connecting with Canadians who feel very left behind, not just by the Liberals, but by the political process as a whole. And that's potent. So I think he's he's not really living up to his potential that you, see, that you can see when he actually tacks to those issues that have 
greater acceptability and interest within a, the centrist pool of voters. That's his potential, and he is absolutely getting sucked in to this other shit that is really squandering that. Uh, and I, for one, am very happy that he is. But uh, so I'm not in complete agreement with Air Bear. I don't. I don't think we anybody should be underestimating him right now. But for sure, he's underperforming based on what we've seen him be able to do. But Scott, surely, I mean, Jordan, his critique is uh, something that uh, you know makes a lot of sense to me intuitively, but. We have to acknowledge that the PolyF people are running a different strategy. We don't agree with it necessarily. It's not the one we would run, but they're running a different strategy. Like I assume that when Jenny Byrne reads that uh, that uh, Brian Mulroney doesn't like her her campaign and that uh, Bill Davis probably wouldn't like it either, she goes, no fucking kidding. That's the point. Yeah, 100%. I mean, like... You know, I don't know if it will work or not, but I think there is a deliberateness and an intentionality to what they're doing um, that, as much as anything, collides with a lifetime of norms that uh, Chantel uh, embraces. So um, unmentioned in this article, but mentioned in other columns she's written about Polyev is the fact that they, they're they kind of indifferent to Quebec. They don't even see it as like they you know whatever pick up five seats maybe if we do like uh, that's also whatever we get there is gravy um we have to build a path to victory i think they're looking at it from a utilitarian perspective we have to build a path to victory that doesn't include quebec because we cannot count on it we can't afford to redirect resources bleed other opportunities um so that's it and then a whole variety of other things that she mentions just i mean he's um uh, their campaign and their messaging and their positioning is uh, so contrary to norms, it's, it, it, um, it seems, I'm sure, almost preposterous to her. Um, and I'm not cond being condescending toward uh, Chantel because I embrace all of those norms. And then there are things that are absolute that I find offensive. And Jordan mentions, you know, the pride parade uh, piece. Like, that's just, to me, it's like, sorry, if you're going to truck and trade in that stuff. Like, if you're going to, Corey talks about the candidates in the next election, you know, here's a tip. Put on your candidate questionnaire, Right? Did you wage your money on the Elon Musk Zuckerberg fight, cage fight? And if you did, you can't run for us. Okay, <laughs> like that down the fucking crazy rabbit hole. Okay, um, and but, and I would just say this: when I read this column, I see a bunch of points I agree with. I see a bunch of important points of analysis being raised, and then I think two things: one, most of those sound to me like arguments as to why he can't get reelected, but not necessarily not elected. Because I think with a strong, with a weak economy and a government that's dented in English Canada so badly and that's seeking to get reelected for a fourth consecutive time, there's a lot of wind at his back and a lot of momentum. And he is a capable mercenary when it comes to messaging, especially around economic um, and working class economic issues. Um, does it mean all of those things mean that once elected, he'll have a hard time governing He'll have a very narrow base to begin with. It'll be extraordinarily hard to build on it and get reelected, particularly without Quebec. Maybe. But I, if, so I go to my second point, which is that if I'm a liberal, right, don't look at that column and say, hmm, that means this guy's toast. We shouldn't be as, you know, and I'm not saying that anybody is so stupid as to suggest that. But I go back to it. It's You end up in the same place. Where's the negative advertising? Hammer the living piss. There are legitimate, legitimate vulnerabilities that this guy has, and I am unconvinced that he's being made to pay for them. And when his vulnerabilities are most loudly raised, it tends to be in moments of frustration when the prime minister at a microphone appears to be breaking out of his message box saying, fuck, well, if nobody else is going to throw mud at this guy, I guess I will. Yeah. Don't put him in that position. Allow there to be a mechanism to uh, highlight all of uh, Polyad's vulnerabilities. Make him pay for some of these positions. Do it now. Define him now. Put him on his back foot. They don't appear to be doing that. I don't get it. I haven't gotten it for a year. I just keep going back to it. But my argument would be that a number of these question marks that Chantel raises really uh, make me think maybe this guy can't get reelected. But almost none of it makes me feel comfortable that he can't get elected. Corey, is there a constituency in, in the CPC for Brian Mulrooney anymore? Like, is that a criticism that rings tr that rings into the party at all? I not anymore. Like, it, may, maybe back in in the days of the Reform Party, you know, there was a 
<clears throat> there was a larger cadre of sort of uh, PC uh, voters who who remembered those days fondly and, and had an affinity to Mulroney. Uh, you know, I I think he's a very uh, interesting and good guy and a, a, you know impactful uh, uh, prime minister and has a strong legacy. All of those things, but he's more of a a, uh, a trivia question. Uh, then he is a political force in terms of the party membership and the party party voting base, uh, and, and you know, and insofar as he'd be remembered in the West, it probably wouldn't be fondly. Uh, you still will see the occasional tax this Brian with the middle finger bumper sticker on an older vehicle, uh, <laughs> but like. Uh, so I, I don't think that's it. I don't think it's that meaningful that he, that he said those things. Um, but I, I do think it, that there is a, a bit of a, a, a whiff of wanting some voters more than others. That uh, that that voters on the right, you know, to to recruit, you know, to bring back PPC voters uh, is more important than attack, uh, attracting uh, our traditional uh, shoulder voters that that flip back and forth with the liberals or the pursuit of uh, NDP voters. Uh, in certain areas of the country, you know, particularly southwestern Ontario and northern Ontario. Um, so, you know, I think they have to guard up against that. I, I think, you know, uh, I'm only speculating because I don't know, but I, I could see one um, sensible strategy for these by-elections would be to try to to uh, defeat the PPC on one front and then go and then go after the other voters during a general election, but use this as an opportunity to to uh, whack them down and yeah, uh, set what those conditions. Uh, so you know, uh, and I think you know, in doing that, that you're gonna you're gonna tilt your messaging a little bit more towards those PPC voters than you would in a general. So like I, I I don't read too much into it in terms of you know the long term projections. I do kind of agree with Scott that you know Chantel, who is I think you know a very smart commentator and you know I think we probably quoted you know had as a clipping more of her columns than anyone else. Um, but she uh, resents leaders and candidates that don't uh, pay homage to uh, the the cottage industry of of Quebec nationalism and and issues related to it, and and the fact that he just doesn't even engage in that, I think, uh, leaves a bit of a bitter taste in her mouth. Hey, can I follow up with you? There are there are from my reading of the polls, there are two voter groups that are keeping the Liberals aloft. And that is middle-aged women yep. and seniors. Yep. Right? Which would you go after if you were Paul Yev? Uh, I, I, think there's a, I think there's a third group, too, and it's millennials. But, um, uh, but uh, yeah, I think, I think middle-aged uh, women would be, you know, the preference that I would take. Uh, tend to vote more. Uh, like I, I think you you have to uh, you to form a majority government you've got to win thirty three to fifty five year old women and you got to really win fifty five plus women as a conservative and uh, well they're getting hammered with those people right now he's, hammered he, with those he, people right he's, now he's, he's he's losing both right now in Ontario I can speak to Ontario not elsewhere but he's losing both of them in Ontario right now and he's got I you know I if you look at past elections you got to win. You don't have to win big with 33 to 55 year old women, but you need to have a be up a couple points there. And 55 plus, you got to be you know significant double digits up. And uh, so I got you know my advice uh, from the peanut gallery would be to to spend more time on uh, highlighting issues to those sets of voters. I think we've seen some indications of that, the, their, their vote in support of uh, child care funding, for instance. So, you know, I, they're clearly cognizant of it and they know how to read a poll as well. So, uh, but, you know, some of those, uh, those voters are, are uh, uh, going to be turned off by some of the issues they're talking about, you know, if you want to, uh, uh, 33 to 55 year old uh, uh, women to uh, support you. I'm not sure why you'd be carrying water for Jordan Peterson, who is probably the most hated individual in Canada to uh, a lot of those voters. So, you know, it just seems there doesn't seem to be any strategy in terms of that. There seems to be a you know a ideological uh, drum they're beating. Um, 
but I think you got to suppress that, and you got to go after uh, you got to go after those those uh, 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 traditional voters that you know when we win in the suburbs of Ontario, they're the ones who vote for us. And like this, so there's a there's a well trodden path in terms of voter coalition to get there. They're just uh, I think pursuing a, a slightly different one, uh, I think I'd give them the benefit of the doubt that that was a strategy around this by-election and to try to take on the PPC first. Uh, and, you know, I agree with Scott like and, and Jordan. I think we're all in agreement. Their narrative around the economy is, is the, uh, the strongest of any of the political parties. And uh, and I see like quite a wide path for them to uh, you know to to walk down uh, around those issues that would lead to uh, to their election. Like they're five or six points away. You know, it, it's not a it's not a ton uh, from from getting a majority government. Uh, but mm. you know, they're 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 tough. They're the they're hardest five percent to the get. Last ones, the last ones to get. Hey, hey J- Jordan, I'm curious as to why seniors are hanging in so well with the government. Given that seniors are generally the people most affected and most freaked out by inflation, because they tend to be on fixed incomes, that's always been historically the political concern about inflation: is seniors, people on fixed incomes. But they are the most solid liberal voting bloc left in the country. Yeah, I mean, I think there could be a couple things going on there. I think the liberals have some maybe legacy goodwill in that group for some of the boosts to income supports they've put through over the years. I think there's some brand trust there. I think there's also a bit of a wait and see happening with Polyev because if the strategy is indeed tack far right and then tacked center, I think people are just waiting for that second to see if that second part happens, to see if he's reliable and can be counted on. Those are typically more risk averse voters uh, in in every sense of of the word. And so I think, you know, they're gonna be it's gonna be watchful waiting from them to see how the winds blow. I mean, I would say it's interesting what Corey is saying, but what I'm really struck by is, um, you know, I think Aaron Wary said this a few weeks ago, is if you look at within within the Conservative Party and the Conservative movement more broadly, even though there's a lot of whinging about the current strategy, there's really only one, if it's a tug of war between the two sides in the party, there's only one side pulling right now. There's no, there does not seem to be any sort of organized opposition from within that is saying, hey, we need to keep a a centrist core. We got to go where those voters are. um, And we have a real problem with what's happening. And I think the danger is that some of the stuff that we've seen, for example, in the by-election, even if it is a strategy just to get those PPC voters back for those for, for that particular cycle, uh, it, like it lives on, right? It's out there. And, and should anyone decide uh, that they'd like to have some accountability in the form of negative advertising, that ammunition is right there for the taking. So we can hope that that will happen. All right. So, hey, you know what also happened last week is Parliament recessed for the summer. Um, it sounds like all the parliamentarians were happy about that. Some of them never want to come back to work, Corey. Um, <laughs> it's true. Yeah, it's true. Um, <laughs> you know, sit, sit at the mat uh, having cocktails while you're voting. It's uh, much more pleasant than sitting in the House of Commons drinking water. No question. So we're two years into the mandate, um, and it's certainly time for talks, stock taking if you're any party, but if you're the government for sure. Uh, Corey, what are you expected to see out of the government this, uh, this summer? Cabinet shuffle. Um, I don't think they're going to do a throne speech because I think they have too much legislation, like you know, gun control and other things that are important to their to their narrative and re-election that they'll want to see through. And so, proroguing is I, I don't think on the table. But I think there needs to be a refresh on on the government. And I think there is enough rumors swirling around and indications that a, the sh- that a shuffle is imminent. That I I believe that'll happen. Uh, I also believe that that can be. Something that that is helpful, or something that is uh, you know uh, insufficient, and Scott's been you know very articulate on this in, in past conversations uh, that you know it has to be substantial and it has to come with uh, with a, a clear narrative around the economy. Uh, if there's one, if I were to say that if there's only shuffled one person in the entire government. Uh, unlike official Ottawa, which says it should be uh, Marco Mendicino, I, I would say it's it's Freeland. Uh, I think they need to get a communicator in there. And uh, if I were to make a suggestion as to who's the strongest to to do that and has the chops to pull it off, I'd say I'd say it's Dom LeBlanc. 
Um, and, uh, you know, but they need to have somebody who can, who can get on TV and, uh, you know, go, go into a press conference with the media and, uh, deliver some tough partisan lines to throw some spears at Polyev. And they, and so you need to need to have somebody who can do that, but you need to have somebody who can give her a coherent and uh, plausible narrative around the economy. And, uh, it doesn't take, you know, uh, 16 questions and 40 minutes into a press conference before they, uh, are able to say something half-heartedly uh, empathetic about uh, the plight of uh, Canadians suffering from from uh, higher prices and uh, reduced purchasing power. Um, you know, Scott, follow up on that, but in particular, remind me why cabinet shuffles matter, given that nobody knows who these people are, any of them. And they don't appear, frankly, to be central to the direction of the government either. So what difference will a shuffle make? Well, I think they very often don't make uh, much difference um, uh, other than telling you about who's who in the intramural zoo uh, in terms of, you know, the sort of blessed council of insiders. Um, uh, and uh, and I, I, that sounded snarky. Like, I mean, like I, I was one of those people. So like, I mean, I you know, we all were right. So um, like that, that's just an, the, the nature of it. Um, I, you know, cabinet you had your favorites, pretty, Volpe. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. Um, was a big, uh, I know guy also. <laughs> um, I, you know, I think, uh, Jimmy K, of course, uh, <laughs> the, you know, to me, the, uh, cabinet shuffle thing, I don't think a cabinet shuffle matters. I think, I, I think a cabinet shuffle is, is a word, a phrase that we use. Uh, to get at the more fundamental point that Corey was talking about, which is whether or not the government is going to narrow the playbook and, and re-engineer its focus around the economy. Um, so um, we talk about a cabinet shuffle because what we really think is um, Freeland is good at government, um, but not good at communication. And right now, uh, what this government needs, and, and I believe... Having mastered being good at government, having got that down, Pat! Yes, it, <laughs> Um, well, I do think not a lot of indications of being good at government in the last six months. Really I've very little say. danger of mastery <laughs> being the word applied there, friends. Yeah, I think you give Freelander due. She's good at government. She's good at managing. She's she's good at managing files. Like, I mean, I think, you know, I still think that the moves she made with Central Bank and, and Russia are enormously consequential. She's really, really particularly good in that fighter firefighter role, which you pointed out before, David. Um, but, you know, from my perspective... You know, they, they it's 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 all about that. So if it's if it's a shuffle, uh, because Freeland is you know uh, out and they have a new economic ambassador, then fine with the shuffle. But my fundamental point is they need a they they need a rejuvenated energy around their economic storyline, and they need um, they don't need a minister as much as they need an ambassador. They need a public representative on this issue. So Brian Topp said on the Chiefs, on the Hurley Burley, that that has to be the prime minister, that there's yeah. nobody that can adequately carry that message other than the leader. I think he's half right. I think if this was an election campaign, that would be correct. Um, I think that ultimately that is correct. But we know that the prime minister is not in the batter's box when he's talking about economics. That's just not his most comfortable place. And when you're in government, and when it looks like you probably have two more years of government, I would argue you certainly can have somebody to serve as a second, to be your ambassador, to be your voice, to be your face, to be there and to communicate more effectively, and then have that reinforced at all possible times by the prime minister, as someone who can cut through uh, the unplowed earth and hammer home that more um, uh, granular economic message. And I don't think they've been able to do that. And I wouldn't underestimate the good that you could do for yourself as a government if you had a new ambassador, if you had a new public representative on economic matters. And uh, again, I'm not, not, I mean, it may be that there were, there's differences required around the cabinet table for a whole variety of reasons. But to me, that's what this government has to get right in the next two years. It's the strategic imperative. If it doesn't get it right, if it doesn't get it corrected, if it doesn't get it on path, then it will be over as a government. If it does, it has a fighting chance. Quick hitter, Scott. Should there be a speech from the throne? No. 
No? No. What? Well, because the speech from the throne is an even an even more Ottawa, even less uh, substantive exercise than a cabinet shuffle. So, you know, put somebody into place who can be that ambassador and who then says, you know what I'd like instead of a throne speech? I'd like somebody in that role the second week of September to give a speech that the government does something unusual about, that it builds expectations around, that it says, holy snapping turtles, this fucking speech is something that needs to be listened to. This is a new framework, a new plan. This is what we're all about. That would be far more effective than a shopping list of items that are going to be overwhelmingly familiar to us that's delivered by people in funny hats and colorful robes so jordan you know the comments of both scott and corey uh indicate that they think the part the liberals need a pivot here that they need a a bit of a reset that they need to come out of here with a more sharply focused message that's economically driven I don't think I get the sense that the government thinks it needs to pivot. Do you? No. And actually, I was going to say, I think Scott's advice is good, but but this PMO has shown no indication that they would have the ability to actually use that advice. And I think what's going to happen is that they're going to start with a cabinet shuffle and they're going to they're going to begin, you know, and and you guys have been through this, right? And that this happens in shadow cabinet shuffles too. You start pulling at that thread and it goes from being an exercise in improving your government's or your party's communication and ends up in an internal caucus management void. And so you end up making moves that speak to those internal imperatives more than they do to your external communications needs. And so I think if I were a betting person, that that's what's going to end up happening in this shuffle as well. I don't think they're going to move Freeland. And I don't think that unless you do that, there is no change. And I think that there's there's three really big problems that they're facing right now that I see. So the first is, and we've seen this all spring, just lurching from crisis to crisis. And, and almost every one of these crises has been self-inflicted, which is really unique. And the first of these problems is that the government is really not working on a functional competence level, but more than that, nobody appears overly concerned about that. There is no sense that there is a five alarm fire happening within the PMO. There is no sense that anyone is like fucking sweating spinal fluid, to quote in the thick of it, uh, in order to resolve these problems. There are no heads on platters. There is no anything that would indicate that people think that this is a core problem. So that is problem one. And that is a problem that flows directly back to the PMO. And until that is solved, I don't think that you're going to be able to get out of this reactive mode that they have been stuck in for the last six months. So that's job one is you, I think whatever change needs to be made there to get the very experienced, but very fatigued people in that office more alive to that has got to happen this summer or you're toast. And then the second one, it goes back to Trudeau. And this is, you know, and I agree. I agree with Top here on this one. I think he has spent the spring being absent. Uh, and when he's not absent, he's been defensive and petulant. Uh, he hasn't put forward a coherent message that puts him toe-to-toe with Polyev in any way that leverages his strengths. Uh, and they've got to sort that out. They need to, like... The prime minister needs to decide, does he want to fight or does he want to roll over? Because right now what it looks like is like he's just he's just ready to, you know, roll over and go for a snooze for the next few months. And that is absolutely a loser posture. And I don't think that they have two years. I think that we're looking at next spring unless things change. So he they got to find some energy and some passion and some drive very quickly. There have been a couple moments where he's had a little spark of it this spring, but it's not been sustained. And I think that, that those are actually linked problems, those first two. And then the last one is the one everyone's been talking about. It's the disconnect. It's the lack of empathy on the affordability question. It's, it's that cost of living and the actual, like, pain and stress and fear that Canadians are feeling is not what those ministers are waking up every day and thinking about. You do not get that sense from the government. And until you do, they are just not going to be able to compete on a narrative level with the Conservatives. And so those are the issues that I see. And I I think that they are fixable over the summer. But to look at it as a narrow issue of a shuffle uh, with all the tendencies that we know that that team has to just go internal, uh, I think is really risky. So, David, can I, can I add one thing? Yeah. Can I add just one thing that's just a small note? But 
a caution I would also throw out to to the Trudeau government is um, don't don't believe in the Bank of Canada, and and I don't mean by that, you know, uh, don't you know you should lack faith in them or you should be upset with what they're doing. I've actually been an advocate. I thought they should have gone up fifty basis points. I thought they should have shocked the system. All this, so I've got a hard ass kind of traditional economic monetary policy view. But what I mean by it is don't don't operate on the assumption that if the Bank of Canada succeeds in getting CPI to 2.3% by December, that your political fortunes reverse and that the pathway to re-election emerges as a blinking runway at night. It doesn't. Like people will not feel or believe that 2.3% inflation equals uh, a, a more affordable, uh, a more prosperous. So, a more Scott, you're 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 going right you're you're going right into the heart of this, which is what the fuck does a progressive populist economic message look like? Like the government has a fucking bad issue set, like infl- um, in the sense that <clears throat> when the cost of living is the number one issue. The most intuitive response for people, for voters, is to say, well, give me some of my money back, Mm -hmm. right? Give me some of my money back so I can pay the goddamn bills, right? I don't, you know, I don't talk to me about Volkswagen. I can't pay the bills. So I don't know really what you're supposed to do about that if you're the party that doesn't want to cut taxes. Yeah. Well, Well, there's one tax in particular. The, that would be the carbon tax <laughs> like that that would be that would be the one to put hit pause on or to roll back on a temporary measure in a temporary way like other other provinces have done on gas taxes etc like that's the obvious one it's just i think it's never on the table for these guys uh, because uh, they're so committed they've you know made it uh, uh you know absolutely tied to uh to uh, climate change policy that uh, even though I think it's you know on a policy basis not a good good example of how to do that, but you know that's the obvious one. But they're not going to do it. So you know I, I'm not sure what what else you could do. Like cut well, I think taxes, that there's that's also that's there are other approaches to monetary policy which we've which we've touched on. You know the the idea of the the two percent target itself, and you you know you've had, David, you've had some really good conversations that drive at the nuances on this, but. There are voices out there talking about what do we do about wages? What happens if if workers have a seat at the table in determining targets? Um, you know, we have shifted the mandate of the Bank of Canada, for example, to in, to include the dual mandate of employment. Maybe that's not enough. Maybe we need to be looking at these things more holistically. I think there's a whole gamut of things that the government could be doing and could be looking at, but it does require some fresh thinking, and there that's just not where they are right now. I would have to turn in my old white man T-shirt if I would agree with the, uh, any of the implications. I'll be, I'll be here to collect it. I'll be here to collect it and warmly welcome you. <laughs> well, I, was just, I was making just an even more basic point, which is that I think there's a when we're talking about the complacency or what appears to be complacency, I think there is a lot of, hey, guys, just don't shit your pants, okay? Assholes like Reed and Hurley go on a podcast and they say, a, every week that the sky is falling, you need to re-engineer everything on a seven-day basis every seven days. But we've got a CNS agreement that gives us stability in terms of being able to manage our way through Parliament, not face the electorate. We've got CPI is falling. The Bank of Canada is making advancements. So by the time we face the electorate, a bunch of these things that feel like they're a burning bush right now will have quieted down, will have will feel less intense. And all I'm saying is that's actually not the way CPI works. That's not the way affordability works. That's not the way the economy works. It is three years after you have conquered economic evils that people might grudgingly begin to believe that things are a pinch better. You're not going to find yourself at the beginning of 2025 or the end of 2024 with people saying, oh, well, I see that CPI is at 2.3% and therefore all of the anxieties I've been carrying around for the past three years have vanished. It's just not how it works. And it's not going to afford you the open electoral door you think it will. As we talked about, I think for, for consumers, for Canadians, for workers, like the worst is yet to come in this. So they got to get live to it very quickly. Right. Bad journey song. Worst is yet to come. <laughs> worst is yet to come. 
Uh, I think that's probably the title of the episode now. Um, <laughs> <laughs> all right, let's call in uh, the great Gordon Pinsent for our Hey Use. Ladies and gentlemen, please return to your seats. The Hey Use are about to begin. Jordan, you want to start us off? I do. This is going out to Olivia Chow, to Michael Hay, to the whole campaign team in Toronto today. You guys have run an incredible campaign. It has been disciplined. It has been focused. It's been hopeful. Uh, and it's been true to the candidate. And these are all really hard things to do in one campaign. So my hat's off to you. You have earned this win if it, if it is yours today. Uh, so go out and get it. There's a lot of people counting on you. I didn't know Michael was running that thing. Good for her. She's awesome. Yeah. Yeah. Scott? Um, I'm going to stick with the city of Toronto. My hey you is to uh, the powers of be. I, I don't like the way we're doing this. You know, we're, we're going to end up, Olivia Chow is going to win tonight. Let's just say things stay where we expect them. Olivia Chow is going to win tonight with 30% of what will probably be about 30% of people voting. That sucks. That sucks for the city. It sucks, by the way, for Olivia Chow, right? Because people are going to question since she, you know, since she doesn't have a majority of council members lining up behind her, they're going to question her mandate, all this kind of stuff. You know, from my perspective, if we're not going to have the party system at the municipal level, so you can clearly say this is the agenda and we've actually established our program and it's been endorsed by the voters, then have a runoff. And what would have made this a much more engaging, I think probably a much more productive election cycle is if you said, all right, we're cleaning out all these other fucking underlings. And now there's going to be in two weeks a face off between pick your choice, Olivia Chow and Anna Bello. I don't know, whatever it is. And then you end up with that person triumphs with a clear mandate. I think a runoff model makes a lot more sense for a place like Toronto. And um, I just, uh, you know, tonight is going to feel... It'll be a clear victory, and I'm not in any way questioning that, um, but it's going to feel like a big, big stamp of half-assery when 30% of people, uh, you know, vote out of 30% of eligible voters. God, I love liberals in favor of electoral reform. <laughs> <laughs> Only ranked I ballots. I swear I'll do it. <laughs> Only ranked ballots. Corey, you got to hate you. Yeah, I, I was going to give mine to uh, Mel Last, uh, Mel Lanceman, uh, who <laughs> Lanceman would be good though. Yeah, yeah, Lanceman. Oh, that's, 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 that's a different. Twice a week, a, garbage delivery. What's wrong with you? People? It goes way no back, right? Oh boy. Yeah, garbage yeah. delivery. That was what's wrong with it. Yeah, garbage delivery. Well, <laughs> it was a type of garbage, guys. It really was. Well, uh, awesome. Mel, I think is uh, I think is one of the most talented people in that in that conservative caucus, and as a deputy leader, I think uniquely positioned to to deliver some of the things uh, that we've been talking about over a number of weeks. You know, to have a spear thrower uh, who can really take the the fight to uh, to the liberals and uh, and to Trudeau, and uh, use a you know a harsher uh, tone. And keep those messages away from Polyev. And I think as uh, as a uh, really dynamic uh, uh, young woman, uh, she you know she is immune to some of the blowback that uh, uh, old uh, gray-haired white guys like me would get if we were doing the same. So I I, I think she's an enormous uh, resource for the party. And I uh, so hey uh, Mel, uh, take take the fight to to the liberals. Hey, yeah, we're trying to get her on the Hurley Burley. There's a standing invitation, so that would be fun if she would do that. Um, and and my hey you goes out to uh, my old uh, friend uh, Ruth Thorkelson out in Alberta. Uh, Ruth is uh, somebody that's originally from Alberta, from a PC family. In fact, as I recall, when she she and I lived together, and her family would come to visit. I think her dad used to call Lloyd Axworthy the King of Pork. Um, <laughs> He wouldn't say anything bad about Paul, but uh, he wasn't a big Axworthy fan. Uh, but in any event, Ruth uh, was a battler for the provincial liberals in Alberta. She was a big Grant Mitchell person uh, trying to keep that thing going back in the 90s. She came to, in the 80s, she came to Ottawa, worked for Paul, became Paul's chief of staff, did a huge amount of the build of the leadership campaign that ultimately forced Mr. Kretchen out 
and won the leadership for us, worked in Paul's prime minister's office. Now she's gone in the midst of raising two kids and having a husband and all this kind of shit. She's gone back to school and she got her master's in political science at the University of Calgary. And she wrote a thesis right about Canadian politics, about the nomination process in Canadian politics. I think it's probably an important academic contribution to uh, one of the more overlooked parts of the Canadian political system. Ruth, you're just the grest, um, and I'm glad to see you're still out there doing shit and influencing people. So congratulations to Ruth Orkelson. All right, everybody, I want to thank... Godmother to Jack Reed. She's Godmother about. to Jack Reed. Uh, I want to thank our presenting sponsor, TELUS, and our sponsor, CN Rail. I want to thank everybody who watched or listened today, obviously Scott, Corey, and Jordan for being here. And uh, hey, a shout out to uh, my buddy Elton, who closed off Glastonbury Festival last night, this last show in, uh, in the UK, and by all accounts, was at Triumph. So well done, little Elton. All right, everybody, we'll see you next week with more Curse of Politics. In the meantime, take care of yourselves.